Addiction can take on many forms, not necessarily only drugs and alcohol. It can be sex, uh, ice cream, many things. And it can either, some addictions can help you and most of them can harm you. And that's what we're here to talk about today because it is a fascinating subject and many people don't even realize they have addictions until they start to examine themselves. And we have a couple of good friends with us today, one really good friend and a new friend with us, uh, Sarah and Andrew. And one thing that when you start thinking about addictions and you think, well, I don't think I'm addicted to anything. You know, like, ah, I think I'm, I don't have any addictions. And then you examine yourself and you're like, well, you know, every morning I like to wake up and have my cup of coffee. And if I don't have it, I feel like something's missing. I've kind of gotten over that recently, but that is something that I started examining with myself. And like, I'm addicted to going to bed early whenever my wife has to work the next day. Like I really like to go to bed early. I don't know why I have this mental thing that that's what I just want to do. And so many other addictions. Uh, if I don't have a cigar to chew on, I feel naked. I don't mind feeling naked, so I like cigars. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's a, it's something that you just don't understand until you really think about it. Because we can be addicted to our routines. Some people are addicted to love, and so if they're not getting love, they feel totally outside of their comfort zone and withdrawal. Some people are addicted to bad moods and bad behavior, and they don't want to change that because that is what they're comfortable with. And people don't want to get outside of their comfort zones and even examine themselves and to understand what they're addicted to. It's been, even with weight, you know, I'm addicted to sitting on my couch and eating um, chips and crap and ice cream. You know, I think my dad has a small addiction to ice cream. I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, these, these things just, just happen. And um, it is worth us taking a, a, some exploration into it because I think all three of us here have had some pretty dramatic experiences with people that we know and love that have had bad addictions. And me, I've had somebody close to me that had a bad addiction and y'all personally, you too, and you had a bad addiction. So I'm really curious, how do you stop doing something that's really bad for you? Because it can be drugs, alcohol, you know, prostitutes, you know, whatever it is, it can be bad. So how do you stop? So you're asking me how to stop? Yeah. How do you stop doing well, first, bad crap? You, uh, first and foremost, you got to start. And I mean, that would be like, I've never done one of these. But, you know, it's almost like you got to qualify to be able to tell you how to stop. So, how, how did you stop you, your bad behavior? Pain. Pain. Yeah, not, not physical pain. Uh, inside, just uh, so much pain that I was crying. I could not catch my breath. Um, I didn't know where or what to turn to because I had already tried every everything except treatment um, because treatment cost twenty eight thousand dollars and I didn't have two nickels. Right. But uh, but you had plenty of cocaine. Plenty. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's where it goes to. Um, we, we, when we're talking about addiction, we got to somehow we got to. I'm not saying we have to. But you got to incorporate recovery into that because they go hand in hand. So, but you got to a place that was so bad. You're crying. You're you're feeling good, bad, and something. You had to hit. You know that infamous or famous term. You know you hit rock bottom. Right. And to that rock bottom moment, something had to snap to make you go, oh. This is bad. I, I have, I'm going to die if I don't uh, change my ways. Right. So how long 
do I have to tell you how I got from just start point talking. A to point B? Yeah. I don't so then, I mean, and it just um, it started out being born a short, fat, ugly kid. And that's exactly how I felt. Where that came in, no idea. Um, I remember my first drink of alcohol that I can remember was like Christmas Eve. Um, all the families in the house and, you know, grandpa and grandmas and they're playing blackjack over in that room and kitchen. You got all the aromas coming out, the molasses cookies and the turkey cooking <laughs> and everything, getting ready for the next day. And us kids, before we went to bed, we could drink a little uh, cup of, and maybe MD 2020. It was Mogan David wine. It might not have been MD 2020. Um, I had a hell of a party with 30 gallons of that one time. I'll tell you about that later. And uh, <clears throat> But I'll never forget that feeling of drinking that and us kids going to bed and hearing the chatter over here and all the aromas and that warm feeling all the way to my big toes. So you, like, you liked it? I loved it. Any chance I could get, I would drink alcohol. Us kids, believe it or not, we raised a lot of hell when we were younger. No way. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and we couldn't wait for like Friday and Saturday nights. We would have family gatherings at somebody's house. And in Florida, everybody has a back refrigerator on their back porch. Everybody does. And that's where they keep the beer. And us kids would raise enough hell in the house where they would kick us out. They'd say, y'all get your asses outside. <laughs> and I mean, our reasoning was so we could get into the beer and we would, I would drink any chance I got because I didn't feel, I felt like I fit in. I didn't feel like that short, fat, ugly kid. So whenever you started um, drinking, it, it, it felt like you knocked the uh, edge off. It gave you a level of confidence. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. So, it was good looking and bulletproof. Right. So I think that is what most addictions start out as. There, there's some kind of emptiness. There's a void. And whenever that you, you take, you know, you know, you drink too much or you smoke whatever too much or you snort whatever, you're trying to feel something inside of you that that temporarily allows you to forget. Was that the case with you? Sure. Sure. Or to just recapture a feel. I love fried pork chops. I love fried pork chops better than anything in this world. <laughs> and when it comes to alcohol or drugs, it was like different. Well, I just need to, I, fried pork chops. Um, and I buy a family pack of pork chops and I fry that whole thing of pork chops and make some yellow rice and some black beans and a little salsa. And that first set, and I'd eat three, four, fried pork chops, and I'd eat my yellow rice, my black beans, and my salsa. And I'd get done, and I'd be man, starting to feel full. <laughs> so I'd be looking at them pork chops. I'd get me a couple more pork chops, and no rice, no black beans, and no salsa. And I'd be getting fuller, and then I'd think, like, I'm, I'm done. Then I'd go get one more fried pork chop, and I would eat it. And I'll be so full that I can't yes, breathe, but I'll be looking at them pork chops. And I go over there and all of us know what I'm talking about. And I peel that fat off that last pork chop and I'd eat that some bitch. And you're already as full as you could be. I could not eat no more pork chops. When it come to alcohol, I would drink one beer and it would make me feel good. And I think, God, I would drink six beers i would drink 12 beers i think like gee i would have some crown royal then the fun started and i would eat to eat less but i would drink to drink more <laughs> don't make sense to some people but it makes sense to yeah me you know and it didn't start out bad. It started I had a wonderful time. I had a wonderful time drinking and doing dope. Wonderful time. Until it got too much. Until I crossed what they call crossed the line. And then I 
didn't live to drink or live to do dope. I did dope and drank to live because of the guilt, remorse, shame that I woke up with every morning and swore I would never drink again. Never. This is after a DWI last night. This is after a public intoxication, uh, pissing in the bushes in Panama City and getting an indecent exposure. I told the cop, I said, dude, no, not that. And he said, that's our ticket for urinating in the public. You know, I quit drinking after them episodes for about four hours. <laughs> I might make it a day. All right. And then it was right back to the same old, same old with, with alcohol. Um, so how, how do you, how do you feel that obviously being sober for 30 plus years, something had to fill that void. I mean, you had to come to terms with yourself in some way that said, all right, th this is the, this is the bottom. You start struggling with all that pain to stop. You had to have some type of self love in there that made you switch. I mean, did, did you have mentors? You have like people around you that just fed you a bunch of love. Uh, I mean, how do you break that cycle of personal sabotage to try to fill that void that's so empty? To I mean, to start, <clears throat> to start um, some of the terrible things like leaving a club. The owner of that club wants cocaine, and he says, "Can you get me some?" Yeah. So I got my best friend in my pickup truck. Got his girlfriend with me. Um, full-size Ford pickup truck. So we're going to another club to get it, and I killed my best friend on the way to that club to go get the cocaine. Because y'all were driving oh, fucked yeah. up. Oh, yeah. I was wasted. And, uh, you know, um, did that stop me? No, it did The times I went to jail, the times the little lady that's five foot seven would come downstairs and be beating on my chest going, look, look at you, look at you, look what you're becoming. That little lady's my mom. You know, none of that. Even <clears throat> the fear of death did not help me to hit a bottom. And in the 30 years that I've been sober, man, I've seen a bunch of it. Oh, death. So, I had Indians dance around me, Billy Graham pray over me. I've done all the, any stupid human tricks, what I call stupid human tricks, except treatment, because I knew that was cost a lot of money and I didn't have it. Um, and I found a group of people that acted and behaved just like I did. I was listening to their stories and I was going like, Damn, I did that. Damn, I did that. I did that. But they were sober. They had nice teeth. Um, they were dressed well. They were laughing. And I said, how did you do this? And they introduced me to a new way of life. And it's something that I've continued to the best of my abilities since May of 92. Yeah, that's fascinating. So it, it really, it, it really took you being around other people with your uh, similar experience, those same people trying to fill their emptiness to help bring you out of your emptiness to find some self love and self respect, and and know that there were other people you could count on to pull you out of that. Absolutely. But it really took you to start with. I mean, you had to make the first steps to find those people. You had to make the first steps all by yourself. Your mama beating on your chest didn't make you go find somebody to help you. Right. Like it was only you right. that could do that. And I've been, uh, and I'm really glad that we're having this conversation because uh, it's a difficult thing. Like you losing your best friend. Uh, I lost my wife. You lost your brother. Man, it's tough. Well, one of the things that, that I think of when I think of losing my brother is, you know, where does it start? And you don't just 
decide, okay, well, I'm going to start drinking one day. And, and like you mentioned, you, that was something that you saw your parents do and that you were given the alcohol. And then this becomes a routine and a pattern. And then it eventually becomes a habit and you're suppressing feelings of feeling a certain way as a child. And that's where general generational trauma comes in that to where it's been passed down from generation to generation and no one's been helped. Nobody's seeing, okay, there's, there's an issue here that we're not addressing. And I believe that mental health really plays a huge deal when it comes to addiction and getting treatment for addiction, because first of all, you've, you've got to realize that you need help. Otherwise you're not going to get it. And second, you know, if you're not trying to figure out the root cause of it, you're just putting band-aids on it. You're just covering up whatever it is that that's causing you to feel the way that you do that, that makes you feel like you need to suppress those feelings. So, and you're doing that by drinking alcohol and doing cocaine and because you feel great, you do, gr you feel great when you drink alcohol, you feel great when you do cocaine pills, whatever. Um, and that, that goes back to mental health. Well, why can't you naturally figure out ways to cope with what you're feeling with when you're feeling depression or anxiety or anything along those lines? And well, I think a lot of that comes uh, our culture and how we are raised in Western civilization is we don't communicate really well. No, Absolutely no nobody, not. nobody talks about hardly anything of any importance. Right. If you keep, a, if you got a problem, you keep it shut up. Right. I'm not going to, you know, it's you better, especially in the South or Texas, you know, uh, we're men. We don't, I don't need to talk about any of these issues. That, that's what pussies do. You know I mean? We're, we're men. I don't need to talk, shut up and get over it. Let's go do this thing. Yeah. Which all this, you know, that, that's fine. There's a time and place. You don't want to be a wine baby and cry baby and all, all the time, but there is a time and place for that where you have to uh, release those emotions. You, you have to be able to express otherwise you're going to have, have this emptiness that never the only way to fill it is to you know try to cram it with uh, drugs and alcohol and uh, that's that's not good or any other thing yeah you know, sex addictions or it's it's something that we're just not even taught you know we go through this whole life uh, where you're lucky if you have parents that say you know, hey, I love you, and you know they show up and do some stuff with you, but that's about the the depth of most conversations and most families of love. I'm expressing my love to you because I show up to do something every now and then, and I uh, I might have a a small conversation about something meaningful, but it's going to be so shallow and so not in depth that that you're left feeling empty. So what do you do? Uh, it feels good to be around a couple of other people that feel uh, as empty as you do. So what do you do? You're all empty together and you try to laugh by, you know, doing shots of tequila. Right. Right. You see the t-shirt? Did you read it? What are y'all? Man, that looks like crazy stuff. What are you pretending not to know? <laughs> oh, for sure. Germany, mean, we fake everything. I mean, everything's <laughs> a right. fake, fake, fake. It, and I don't know, it's really difficult because it, you want to reach out to people that have addictions that are harming themselves, the ones that aren't addicted to a, a positive way of life, the ones that are not addicted to really doing and living the best they can. All of the uh, negative addictions, you want to help them, but there's really no helping. Could, nobody could have helped you or your brother. See, I don't. I don't believe that. I, I believe that once someone makes their mind up that they want help, oh, that yeah, they, can. they can. So I, I feel like um, at that point in time, my brother did want help. He actually reached out about six months before he died, um, really wanting help. The, the issue with that was our state, and I live in Louisiana, our state mental health system is awful. There's, there's no help. And at that point in time, this was in 2006, he, um, I could not get, I contacted every rehab facility, every play, Brentwood, everywhere that I could think of ponds back then. Um, no one would take him because on top of his, uh, he was taking methadone and meth and, um, Xanax. So no one would take him because 
the Xanax addiction could cause seizures and no one was mentally equipped to handle that. So instead of no one helping him when he wanted help because they weren't allowed to. That's a good point. He ended up overdosing on those two things on accident because he couldn't, we couldn't get him into any facility. Now, as far as me helping him, um, that was just there when he needed it. And I've actually helped a lot of people that way. And I've been helped that way. After my brother died, I went off the deep end. Did you? And, and so it was, it was not fun, but that I was trying to fill a, a void. And basically it's just, if you're sober or you, you're not deep in addiction, then you, when someone reaches out, be there. When they're drunk and they're falling over in their stupor and they are got an eight ball of cocaine laying out in front of them, they don't want help. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want help. There's nothing that you're going to say or do in that moment that's going to change them doing that next line or having that next drink because they're already fucked up. So they're going to they're going to continue on that route until they hit that rock bottom or until they sober up. And sometimes they don't get sober. It's just a constant everyday thing. So um, the main thing is, is to be there for them and to have those resources that are available. There's not many. Like you said, rehab is expensive. So unless you have great insurance, then but just be there, be open, be available. Uh, CADA, uh, the Cato Alcohol and Drug, I think. I don't know what yeah. all it. Yeah. yeah. Cato alcohol drug abuse. Is yeah. that what it? Okay. Yeah. They're an amazing resource. They will come get you in the middle of the night. Right. If you want somewhere to go. I've um, got Bill Rubs on speed dial. Yeah. <laughs> They're amazing. They're amazing. I've, I've reached out to him before be from, that, Bill. <laughs> from other people that, that have asked for help. And I saw this one girl in the, in the bar, me in the bar drinking and she's in there and I could tell she was not drinking. She was completely methed out. And so I just started talking to her and I started talking to her about my brother. And whenever I would go up there, she was always up there and she was always high. I was like, what is it that you need? What can I help you with? And it was probably six months of that. Just me having a, every, no one else would talk to her. Everyone else just was like, well, that's the meth head. She comes up here and plays her video poker. She would put like $5 in she would cut, come to find out she was coming up there because she was being beaten by her boyfriend and she was trying to get away from him. But they were doing drugs together and she couldn't figure out a way to get away from him. And I gave her my number and we just talked and I was drinking. I was probably drunk some of the nights, felt like an asshole, but I was still there when she called and she's sober now. She went through Kata. She went through rehab. She's got a little job across, around the corner from me at a little uh, bayou. Well, I'm not going to say where, but a little um, sandwich shop. And I drive through and see her and she's so sweet. She just needed somebody there. She needed someone to not judge her and to not assume that she, that's where she wanted to be because it wasn't, that is not where she wanted to be. And so she just needed someone. And I, it's important to be needed, to feel needed and to feel loved. That's for sure. Right. And you, you touch, you touch on it. When I first got sober, I remember uh, my, uh, first mentor, let's say, took me to Rust State Hospital. <clears throat> and this is the way they used to do it. Mm -hmm. I, this guy did. And I was like, dude, what are we here for? And I don't know if y'all know what Rust State Hospital is. It's a pretty tough place. And we go through these doors, click, click, click. We get in there. And they said, come out. I said, what? And he says, look in there. There was a door, had a window about that big. And there was two guys in there. I think one of them was naked. One of them had a little pair of shorts on. He said, look at their fingers. I said, what? He said, look at them. And he said, what do you see? I said, I don't know. He said, no fingernails. Mm. No fingernails. And they had no teeth. And he grabbed me by the head. Push my face up against that glass. And he said, that's you. They were wet brain. What does that mean? With the alcohol. Oh, they had, didn't die, but their mind just went gone. And they removed their fingernails and their teeth so they couldn't do themselves or anybody else harm. Mm. Oh, that's a bad Kept place to be in. Sedated. I mean, they used to do the Belladonna shock treatments. 
you couldn't get, um, like you say, you know, if you if you were on pills, Cater wouldn't take you or the pines. Um, you should you you'd have to be drunk, and there's been many times. Many times that I've left Carthage, Texas, with some of the people that y'all know that don't drink, that are crackheads. And I got them fucking wasted on alcohol just to be able to dump them off and get them in treatment. I have let them smoke crack from Carthage, Texas to the Pines or what was the, the I, can't, I can't remember it. Uh, just so I could dump them off and they would be high when they walked in. And here I am sober and letting some, some bitch smoke crack. Uh, I could go to prison for that shit. Yeah, but I sure. really didn't care if I could help another human being. Mm -hmm. Just like today, if one person can walk out of this room or one person make a change, this all this is well worth it. The only reason that we're really together, and the reason that we come together, uh, at least we do here, with many different people every Sunday, is to talk about issues we typically don't talk about in our normal life. And one of them is the addiction is a big role in most people's lives, and they don't really understand how it affects so many people. And almost everybody we know is addicted to something, trying to fill some type of void. Uh, yeah. One thing that has impressed me uh, about addictions and how to stop was my dad was really impressed. I, like this is something that's really stuck with me in a big way. Is he said, "Yeah, you know, I've been smoking cigarettes my whole life, and one day I just decided to stop." I'm not sure he occasionally would smoke. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but I never saw him. Nobody that I know ever saw him smoke again. That's impressive to me because to have a habit of smoking cigarettes for the majority of your adult life and just one day you go, nah, I'm done with that. That's a, I just I've talked to great. a lot of addicts and they have told me that quitting cigarettes is one of the hardest things because it's it's legal and you're not getting messed up on it and it it makes you feel good but you don't see the repercussion of it until you've got lung cancer right you know and so i've had people tell me that that you know that's, that's what it was so impressive yeah that's cases. what it was so impressive to me because i know how powerful that cigarette addiction can be and just to go eh, i'm done <laughs> like wow that is really really <laughs> impressive and then uh it was kind of funny. It was not really funny, but I had a friend of mine that uh, was a pretty, um, what are they, a functioning alcoholic? Like he would drink from the time he got up until the time he went to sleep. But he was never like falling down drunk or anything. He was just a functional, uh, yeah. it wasn't that he was doing it socially where he wanted to have a couple of glasses of wine or, you know, he, he had to have his alcohol all day long. And then, his family made him go to this uh, some type of therapy, and he stopped. And but he always drank out of a Dixie cup, all of his whiskey, all the time. And then he started just filling his Dixie cup full of either coffee or water. And he told me, and he has this kind of rough voice. And he goes, "Well, hell, I don't think I was ever addicted to the whiskey. I'm addicted to this damn Dixie cup." <laughs> Habits. It's like it's like I just really like holding this Dixie cup all the time because it gives me something to do. It got my my man. I think that's probably a lot to do with why I enjoy cigars so much because I it's something to do. Yeah, I, I can think. I, I can sit here and contemplate, you know, but I got something in my hand, and well, plus I just love it. And I guess he loved his Dixie cup. And he was serious about it. Like, he wasn't joking. He was like, you know, I really think that I've been addicted to this Dixie cup because you never saw me drunk falling down, but you never saw me without that damn Dixie cup. <laughs> right. You know, when you bring up the, the nicotine, and of course, that is, that's, it's bad. Me and your old man, we've smoked a bunch of cigarettes together. A bunch of cigarettes. I we? bet so. And then he quit, and y'all had a case a box of cigarettes, packs, and gave them to me. 
Yeah. <laughs> what a friend. <laughs> I, I quit. I quit smoking cigarettes the night of my 13th anniversary of being sober. And I quit smoking, never took a hit off shit until I was doing Austin's wedding right across that parking lot. Yeah, oh, here? And it was 45 <laughs> minutes before showtime. I got to feed 150 people. Everybody's out back, all my staff, they're smoking cigarettes and vaping. And I smell this vape smell. And I said, give me a hit off that. And I took a hit off of it. And now you got vapes. <laughs> oh, well, that's something. Addictions I'm can <laughs> come back at, at any time. It don't, it don't matter. I, all I got um, is a daily reprieve contingent upon my spiritual condition. I didn't say God. I said contingent on my spiritual condition. Right. I could drink just like that. I could do Bill back doing dope just like that. I could go back to being at the casinos just like that. I could get back into a sexual addiction just like that. If I act upon that. Mm -hmm. It takes a force of will, a, a constant awareness. Well, so tell it, me about it. it. How would it's, it? Yeah, yeah, but it's not. A, a lot of people um, will say, well, my mom man used to say, he used to say, well, if you had willpower, you could quit that shit. Well, I'll tell you what. If you really think you got willpower, really, 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 Go buy you a box of x lax and eat half of it and don't go shit for hours. <laughs> if you can do that, you've got willpower. He has a willpower. You know what I'm so it's not, a, it's, not, it's not about, it's not about, willpower. And it's really not about drugs and alcohol. It's not about nicotine. It's not about coffee. It's not about shopping a lot. It's not about work. I mean, all of them things can be addiction, uh, uh, an addiction. If you take them away, all that stuff I just said, the alcohol, drugs, the work, the sex, the, take it all away. You still got you. You got to feel. So I got to feel right now. I feel pretty good right now inside. You know what I mean? I yeah. feel good. It's because of my behavior today. Mm -hmm. um, so if you take all these things that I was addicted to away, I got to do one thing. I got to feel. If I feel bad, I can resort back to drugs and alcohol or gambling or sex or whatever in the hell I want to do to change the way I feel. Or I can change my behavior that's making me feel the guilt and the remorse and the shame. Because that's what causes me to do, not drink the coffee. How do you, I don't how, think how, that, I just like coffee. How but do you change how you feel? Huh? How do you change how you feel? How, how do you change that shame and... That's your, your coping I, 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 I look at my behavior. What's making me feel, what's making me feel guilt, remorse, and shame. Right. And the only way I'll look at it is the pain that it causes. And, and it could be pain of going to jail. It could be uh, pain of pe people calling you out. Um, and that's not the case with me today. It's the inside pain that I get. I go like, oh, you dumbass, what are you doing this for? You know what I mean? Just like every once in a while, I think when I'm taking a hit off this vape, what the hell are you doing this for? You know, I can't even give can I even give you a, a good reason why I'm vaping again? Because I want to vape, you know? right. and it's not hurting anybody. It's not hurting anybody. That's twenty five dollars a week to let start doing the math. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Are you you know what I'm saying? Is it hurting somebody? Yeah, it is. It's hurting maybe my future. Yeah, my health. And other people that you love, perhaps. Uh, right. I mean, when I'm over, when I was in Florida a few weeks ago, um, my mom didn't know I'm vaping. She'd have a stroke if she knew I was vaping. I was taking her time that I should have been spending with her because of my addiction to 
It's called, I'll be right back. I got to go, you know, check the phone or something. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's all horse shit. You know, even when I was drinking and drugging. Um, of course, I had a lot of amends to make and people that I hurt. But I was like, well, I didn't hurt my family. I didn't hurt this. Yeah, I wasn't my sister's brother. I was not my mother's son. I wasn't my dad's son. You know, I wasn't a, my employer's employee. I was not. I mean, I stole from all them people. I took from all them people. Not money, time. Yeah. yeah, the one thing you can't get back and those connections and memorable moments you could have shared that are all gone forever. Forever, ever, ever. Yeah, can't unscramble that egg. No. no. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. It, it, you're like you're talking about health, of vaping. Uh, we have uh, an obesity problem in this country and everybody's addicted to you know nasty, horrible food that's full of poisons and Toxins. We've never been this fat as a nation. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. It's hideous. And we start to make excuses for it. And uh, and it causes people the same thing. It's not so different from uh, the abuse of drugs and alcohol. And that, hey, I, I can't get up and go take a nice stroll with you, mom, because I just can't breathe. Taking a, you know, I'm just too, I'm just too lazy now to get my ass up off this couch and go take a stroll. Well, that goes back to with what you were saying of it's how you feel on the inside, and so if you, you want to be lazy and okay, well, I can go to McDonald's and I struggle with this. This is something I'm struggling with right now. It's so easy to go to McDonald's and get a cheeseburger and fries because it tastes good instead of educating myself on what proper nutrition would be and, and preparing that and taking the time to give back to my, my physical health. And so it just plays into, well, how am I going to treat myself? And that's a lot of negativity that you're putting back in your life. So if you're feeling down and you stay in this negative mood, then you're not going to want to go out and go for a stroll. But if you're like, okay, I've got to get out of this mood. I've got to figure out how to deal with these emotions and deal with these feelings that I'm feeling because I'm sober now and I don't need to just drown it. Then, then you got to get positive and you've got to go out for the walk and you've got to go figure out some exercise or eat that healthy meal, do all the things that are good instead of I loved how you put that. Just shoving all the, the negative energy and the negative aspects. That was in. a really good point because we can take our uh, behaviors or our desires and we can say, uh, we can make that a bad emotion and then it, it compounds, it feeds on it. So we just do more of the bad stuff. But if you're around, but if you can, um, at, at least for me in, in a lot of different ways, I find inspiration and other people and how I want to act. Like if I want to act and learn something, uh, I want to be around those kind of people. Or if I don't have the, uh, if those kind of people aren't around me, I'll find them some way, whether it's through uh, courses or different video, whatever. I'll force myself to, to do that because I want that positive reinforcement. Um, I, I'll tell you a really simple, good example. We have some guests uh, staying with us for the weekend from out of town. And I did not particularly want to go work out this morning, even though I had to force myself to go work out. I just something I do, even when I don't want to. But I do know the difference whenever I don't want to just like go get after it, go in there and kind of half-ass do a workout. Well, this this guy, super good looking, badass triceps, and he has good looking legs. I just noticed his legs last night. I was like, damn, man, he has some powerful legs. And today was our leg day. And so I woke up this morning and I was like, man, I'm glad that energy, his energy came to me. And it made me want to go have a really good workout. Wow. And so I did. And so you can put yourself and just find yourself in situations instead of reinforcing that where, eh, we'll, just, we'll go have a, a pretty good workout. Instead, it was a... I'm going to go have a great workout. I'm going to have a great workout. And then you surround yourself with, you know, other positive energies. And it really can change your life if you focus on, like, 
it's kind of hard sometimes, but if you like food is a good example, instead of, oh, it's so easy. I'm just going to eat this other pile of crap. I'm going to make an excuse or a joke or put a, you know, but really you're harming yourself and everybody that you love. Then if you kind of switch that to a, a positive mind frame, like, oh, I am going to find out what is good for me in food. And then I'm going to, oh, this is really good. Uh, I'm going to eat some more of this. I wonder how I can cook this so I like this better than McDonald's. I wonder if I can do this in, in a better way. I wonder if I eat snacks that are super healthy when I'm really hungry and want to fill that void. I'm doing something positive instead of going, well, I need some energy. I'm going to go drink a Mountain Dew. Right. A bag of Fritos. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then make a joke about it because it's funny. Right. But it's not funny because, you know, you're <clears throat> destroying your teeth, tearing up your guts, and uh, sugar is the worst addiction in human history, and then the fuel of all cancer. I mean, it's crazy. So I think that's a really good way to end this discussion is, is try to find ways to be positive in our mental behavior and be around people. Like you said, you were able to find people that supported you, loved you, and, and, and gave you strength through positive, whether they were positive in their example and they were positive in how they talked to you, and that positivity moved you in your life in a positive way. They were positive in their actions. Right. And they were and good of, with their bullshit, but <laughs> their actions, and that's what I wanted. Not the line bullshit. Right. I watched our actions. That's right. And that is the, I think the whole goal of everything in life, just not addictions to find people that will do what they say they're going to do. And when you need help, they are there to help you. And you're around positive, loving people that reinforce that. And it makes life better for all of us. Sure. Oh. And so if you feel like you need to vape again, I'm happy to hug you. Okay. Because <laughs> I love you guys. Thank you, know, you all for that's coming. That's what it's about, hugging each other. Yeah, hell yeah, it's about other, hugs. Laughing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, the world will rock. Yeah. Well, thank y'all for joining us. You can find us, of course, on YouTube, BitChute, Rumble, Odyssey, and a couple other ones that I don't remember. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.